Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Scoliosis Dialogues from the Scoliosis Research Society. This is Perry Ishmael from uh, Shriners Hospital for Children in Philadelphia. And uh, today I have with me Dr. Huicho Odogwa, who's a neurosurgeon at the uh, University of Cincinnati. He's here to discuss differences in uh, outcomes in surgery and adult deformity uh, between um, uh, males and females. Uh, welcome, Dr. Odogwa. We're really excited to have you today. You know, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are you? Where do you come from? What do you do? Where did you train and why do you do what you do? Very good. Thank you very much for the invitation and certainly to the SRS for the opportunity to have this discussion around scoliosis. Um, originally from uh, Nigeria, uh, spent some time in the West Indies and uh, um, came to, to Duke University many years ago as, a, as an athlete. Um, played soccer there and then off to Vanderbilt University for medical school and then back to Duke for um, uh, for residency in Russia, Chicago. I, uh, I completed two fellowships, one in neurosurgery uh, with, Rich, with, uh, with Rick Fessler, which is a minimally invasive and adult complex uh, spine fellowship at Rush. And then I subsequently went up to Wash U in St. Louis. And really the impetus behind that was, you know, when we did all, uh, these deformity surgeries at Rush, they were mostly um, done uh, minimally invasively. And I had several questions. Uh, where do you stop your UIV? How do you treat uh, pediatric patients? Is that a different population from adults? Uh, um, and what, is the out what are the outcomes in, in after pediatric reconstructive operations? Um, and so Wash U answered a lot of those questions for me. Um, and after Wash U, I remember having a conversation with Keith Bridwell. I asked him a single question, which is, how do you, how do you identify a UIV in patients with adult deformity? This is after 10 months of fellowship. And he said, Wicho, it'll take a, an hour to have that conversation. Okay. Uh, at that time, I was fortunate that uh, Pierre Rousseli, who was in Lyon at the time, and he, had, he was discussing a very novel way of thinking about deformity, uh, not so much focused on the PILL mismatch, but around where we do the osteotomies and balance the spine. So I went up to France for another fellowship. I was there for a few months. And then I rounded off uh, uh, back on the continent, the African continent with Hannibal Boachi wow. uh, in at Focus Hospital in Ghana, which really rounded off my education. So I have, uh, I consider myself an honorary, honorary orthopod. You know, I spent a lot of time in orthopedics and, uh, and, and, and certainly uh, I've learned a tremendous amount. I think what I, why do I do what I do? I, 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 when I think about spine, whether you are a degenerative surgeon or a scoliosis surgeon, we're working on the same problem. Uh, how do we align and balance the spine? And we have this misnomer with alignment and balance. And the key thing to, to keep in the consideration is alignment is static and balance is dynamic. So whether the patients present with lumbar radiculopathy in a single level disease, multi-level degenerative problems, or more complex scoliosis problems, I believe that the treatments are really the same. How do you put the head over the hips, over the knees, over the ankles? How do you really balance the spine? Um, I love what I do. Uh, I think we have an opportunity to really restore patients' quality of life and function in a way that most other subspecialties don't have the opportunity to. Uh, so, uh, and, and certainly as a deformity surgeon, we're oftentimes the last resort. And uh, it's really rewarding and the privilege to, to give these patients back the quality of life that they, that, they, that they seek. Wow, I mean, that's fantastic. I mean, you're certainly really well trained. And, uh, you know, I, I love your impetus uh, for doing what we do. That's kind of similar to, you know, how I feel about things. You know, I'm, I'm a pediatric orthopedic surgeon, so I do uh, not just spine. I also take care of kids with uh, lower extremity pathology, fractures, et cetera. And, you know, that's really what's drawn me to, you know, everything that I've uh, been doing over the last several years. That's amazing. So, you know, today we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, sex differences, uh, you know, uh, between males and females in um, adult deformity surgery. Uh, those of us who treat children, uh, you know, such as you, yourself and, and me, you know, we know that, uh, you know, there are some uh, subtle and not so subtle differences in treating, uh, you know, pediatric patients. You know, we know that boys uh, tend to present with slightly bigger curves. You know, the curves may take a little bit longer in the OR and uh, may have slightly less correction, higher blood loss, et cetera. But, you know, overall outcomes tend to be pretty similar. 
uh, you know, Dan Cicado, uh, Dan Hedequist, and Lori Carroll, you know, had their study in uh, the mid 2000s, which kind of put this forward. But I know that you published on the differences uh, between the sexes and adults. So why don't you tell me a little bit uh, about uh, your experience and also uh, your papers? Yeah, so I think when you think about adult deformity and um, uh, and the sex differences they exist, without question, there are some sex differences that we're actually learning a lot more. Uh, and I'll sort of get into some of the work that we're doing in the laboratory that sort of reaffirms that. Uh, we were interested in this exact same question. Are, are there differences in presentation? And are there differences in surgical resilience? And are there differences in complications profile? And this concept of sur surgical resilience isn't something that we've necessarily explored as a specialty. But I think that there is there's some data that shows that uh, that concept, surgical resilience, and how you measure it and how you track it can be sort of tied into frailty, can be tied into convalescence, can be tied into complications. So what we looked at uh, over uh, 150 patients who underwent uh, adult spinal deformities, uh, correction, uh, we had almost an even smattering of men uh, and, and women uh, in the study. Uh, and the primary question was, are complication rates different? We looked at the radiographic parameters at baseline and very similar to what you see in the pediatric population, the adult population had, females had slightly worse uh, radiographic parameters compared to the adults, but it would not significant, clinically significantly different. There was a trend towards different, but it wasn't different. But when you look at some of the psychosocial um, um, parameters, uh, depression, affective disorders like, uh, like anxiety, those tended to be worse in females. When we looked at the patient reported outcomes at baselines, we looked at pain, we looked at disability, we looked at quality of life, and we looked at cognition. Uh, those, all of those scores also tended to be slightly worse in women. So we went into the analysis assuming that women then, or female patients, were going to have worse mechanical failures and worse PROs compared to men after reconstructive operation. And that did not turn out to be the case. The degree of functional improvement from women after surgery uh, was superior to men. So you, there were no differences at two years after surgery, which means that if they started off at a worse level and there are no differences at two years, they actually showed a greater degree of functional improvement um, after surgery. And there were no differences in the rates of mechanical failures uh, between men and women. So it really shows you that the outcomes, the surgical outcomes, uh, certainly what that suggests is surgical outcomes are, are, are similar uh, between male and females, although the women tend, to, female patients tend to have uh, slightly worse radiographic parameters. Now, when you look at the concept of surgical resilience, it's something I'm studying in the laboratory now. And this is work that came out of Iowa looking at uh, uh, really uh, in vivo studies uh, where they were looking at testosterone, testosterone and its impact on convalescence and certainly on outcomes. And what we found, uh, just anecdotally looking at some of the preliminary data, uh, patients who have higher levels of testosterone report less pain after surgery, have better rates of convalescence and have shorter length of hospital stay. So there's this, this, this concept of surgical resilience, how you measure it. We don't have the perfect biomarker. We are leaning towards testosterone um, as a potential marker for that, uh, but we don't know. But there's, there's something there, but we don't know what, those, uh, what, that, what that biomarker might look like. Wow, uh, that's interesting. I mean, uh, do you have a, an idea as to why this is the case? I mean, now, or is, are we going to start like checking everybody's testosterone before surgery? I mean, how, how is that really going to work out? Yeah. So one of the couple of the things that we're doing in the laboratory is we're collecting blood samples before surgery and at several time points after surgery. And we're looking at several uh, genetic markers. We're looking at RNA sequence and then some other things mm -hmm. uh, to identify this uh, milieu or what I call this, uh, this uh, uh, milieu of, of uh, inflammatory markers that might predict which patients might convalesce better after surgery. It could be that testosterone may be a marker for something else that we are not measuring, that we are not seeing now. So I'll give you a slight example. When I was at UT Southwestern, we took, a, we took 40 patients who had adult and deformity surgeries. We had baseline markers in addition to very comprehensive uh, psychosocial evaluation of PROs examinations. And we had blood markers uh, after surgery. And what we found in that preliminary study 
for patients who have higher levels of IL-6, IL-8, and TNF-alpha, so these neuroinflammatory cytokines, were more likely to have uh, uh, poor, um, poor pain control after surgery, longer hospital stay, and um, challenging problems with convalescence after surgery. This is similar. A similar story has been told in other subspecialties, right? If you have high levels of baseline inflammation, you're more likely to have a cardiovascular event. You're more likely to have things like Alzheimer's. You're more likely to have things like strokes. So what this test says to me, this preliminary data, is that if we can identify patients, if truly inflammation uh, could be a biomarker for surgical resi resilience, if we can identify patients who have high level of inflammation before surgery, there might be a therapeutic window to intervene prior to your, to your, to your, to your operation to, to improve the post-operative complications profile. So that data suggested that there is there might be a biomarker the problem with that design, uh, Terry, is that we use a, a candidate gene approach. So we picked four mm -hmm. or five cytokines. And you could imagine that we're missing thousands of others, which yeah. is where this, the, the work is heading towards. So I don't have an answer as to what that mm -hmm. magic biomarker might be, but I think we're getting a little closer to telling that story. Wow, that's really exciting. I, mean, I can't wait to you know hear uh, you know your results in the, in the future. Wow. So anything else uh, to add on, uh, you know, differences? I think that, you know, it's interesting that, you know, we might have uh, thought that one sex versus the other might have uh, done a little bit worse. But I mean, it sounds like the results of your of your uh, studies have uh, should have not borne this out. Any uh, understanding as to why this happens? I, I know you were talking about, uh, you know, surgical resilience. Are we saying that maybe females are a little bit more resilient than males? Uh, you know, that's that's an interesting question. <laughs> that's a bit of a stretch. I don't yeah. know that we, we can we can we can say that. I think yeah. what this go what this says in my mind when I look at results like this, it says that mm -hmm. for the appropriate patient, independent of gender, that we can help that independent of them that we can help. Now, the, mm -hmm. the, the nuances that I think that we still need to tease out is this concept of frailty. So we know frailty affects outcomes. The question is, are women, are female patients more likely to present with very advanced uh, frail, uh, 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 very advanced frail states compared to their male cohorts? You have issues of sarcopenia, right? Now, uh, women more likely to, because they have smallest paraspinal muscles, the sarcopenia affect both sexes equally. And yeah. if you think about sarcopenia and what happens as we get older with the loss of extension and the, and the, and the, uh, and almost, uh, the, so we think about how we lose extension versus flexion. We lose extension the much faster than we use the ability to flex. So if you have weaker extensor muscles, sarcopenia frailty, you may be more apt to develop in things like proximal junctional failure. Okay. You stop in lower thoracic spine. So I think that there are several questions that we still have unanswered. Uh, yeah. is, is it purely biology, right? Or is, is, is it biology that plays into concepts like frailty? And what can we do as surgeons if there is indeed a sex difference in the rates of frailty, in the, in the uh, severity of the frailty and so on? What can we do as surgeons to sort of optimize the outcomes of female patients? But as, as it stands, the data doesn't bear that there are any differences in the patient reported outcomes or the mechanical failure rates between women, men and women. Well, that's amazing. Well, look, man, well, thank you so much for joining me. I mean, I'm sure our viewers have uh, will learn a lot today. I certainly have, and you've uh, given me several more questions that I want to ask, and I think I'll ask you off air. I mean, it's amazing stuff. Thanks for coming, man. And, you know, the, this is uh, Scoliosis uh, Awareness Month, and uh, so this will be airing next week. And, you know, really, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the invitation to, to, to share this. And I, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. And thanks to the SRS. The Scoliosis Research Society is a nonprofit professional organization made up of physicians and allied health personnel. Their primary focus is on providing continuous medical education for healthcare professionals and on funding and supporting research in spinal deformities. Please visit srs.org for further information.